Yes, welcome and thank you for being here today. I'm Navneet Singh, your host for this webinar. I know that today's topic may bring up a number of questions from you. So you may type your questions in chat box and I want to let you know that we will address as many as we can in the time we have today. And I welcome and request our NBMS National Webinar Coordinator, Professor Dr. Nilima Gupta, to start this session. Thank you and over to you, ma'am. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Namit. So I welcome uh, all the participants and uh, I welcome uh, Dr. Pavan. And uh, just to introduce Dr. Pavan briefly, Dr. Pavan Singhal, he is a senior professor at uh, SMS Medical College, uh, Jaipur. And uh, he did his MBBS from Ajmer and his uh, MS from SMS Medical College. And then he is uh, working as faculty over there. Among his various interests, uh, head and neck oncology is his uh, one of the interest areas. Then he's also uh, good at otology and he does all rhinology surgeries as well. And um, excellent uh, speaker and newly elected uh, governing body member in the AOI national body. And we are looking forward to hearing from you, Dr. Pavan, today. And today's topic, as you all know, is uh, A to Z of hearing rehabilitation. And I'll uh, hand the mic to Dr. Pawan then. Thank you, Dr. Nilima. Thanks for the kind words. So, uh, friends, we are going to discuss something about hearing rehabilitation today. Uh, it is, uh, you know, the incidence of hearing loss, if you see, uh, we have always been talking, our society has been very sensitive towards blindness. First, but if you take into consideration the hearing loss, the hearing loss is more common as compared to blindness there in the society. So we ENT surgeons should have uh, some responsibility to raise this matter in front of the policy makers, the ministers, prime minister, so that we can have good deafness control program, although a program is going on. So what is the incidence around uh, there? These, this is four to six child are born deaf uh, per thousand uh, in Indian population, if you go by the data, and it is more common than the visual impairment, as I've already told you. Most of the uh, kids, they belong to the, uh, uh, this thing, your zero to three years of age. So is it really rehabilitation? No, it is basically habilitation. What is rehabilitation is to restore some loss function, but there is no functioning hearing apparatus there as such in these kids who are born deaf. So it is basically habilitation we are doing, developing the skill which is not present before and in infants and children because they are congenitally deaf. So what are our aims of habilitation in these uh, hearing deprived or hearing impaired kids. We need to develop speech and language so that these kids, they adjust in the society well. And not only adjustment in the society to go along the normal stream of kids or the population, they should also get a good employment for their vocation to earn their bread. So this is our, our aim of habilitation does not end by doing just a surgery of cochlear implantation or maybe advising a hearing aid. No, <clears throat> we have to develop a good speech and language skill in that. They should be well trained by an audiologist or maybe the auditory verbal therapist. And then they should be competent enough to go and uh, go along the stream of the normal kids. So we follow certain path of doing this, like identifying at first, is there any hearing loss? If this is some hearing loss is there, what is the grading of hearing loss? What is the severity of hearing loss? Which type of hearing loss is it? So to, to get that, we have to do a audiological evaluation of these uh, kids, maybe Vera, OA, or for the elder kids, you can have pure tone audiogram tympanogram to know the all the arc and all those other tests which I'm not going into detail. You can just see there in the books more in, the most important things which are asked in the examination and which you should know I have included. The rare things 
uh, anything which is which requires a, a literal study, I'm not including that. So once you know they are hearing deprived, you can advise hearing aid or some assistive listening devices to them. And but you also need to guide the parents because parents they play a major role in habilitation of kids of, of these hearing impaired kids. Then earliest intervention should be done once you know that they are hearing challenged. Earliest inter intervention. These days, please don't write deaf child. You have to write hearing challenged or especially abled child. We, this is the guideline which has been given by Ministry of Health and Family Welfare and these are uh, basic rights of an individual that you can't call them deaf or blind or something like that. You have to call them maybe especially abled or you can, you can just write hearing challenged or vocally challenged, okay? Then you have to develop some communication skill in them and literacy, and then comes the literary development for cognition and all. So why do we need early identification? Why not? Any age child comes, you give them hearing aid, maybe 17 years, prelingual, and job done. No, it is not done. We have to intervene earliest. <clears throat> and you know why? Because there has been many misconceptions in the society, like parents will come to know at the age of two or maybe three months only that he is child. No, they don't come to know. We get so many kids with the parents, uh, kids of the age of two or three years or maybe four years or five years who are hearing challenged, who don't have any hearing. Still their parents are like, no, Dr. Sahib, he listens well, but he doesn't speak. So these are some myths there. So we have to remove those myths. And then they say, when we clap, he listens. No, he just seeing the movement of your hands. The young child will not be able to handle the hearing aids. It is wrong. Once you apply a hearing aid, and if the child is listening to the hearing aid, the child slowly, slowly adapts to the hearing aid. And he feels better with the hearing aid. And then one more myth is hearing and speech habilitation starts with the little is wrong. Hearing and is the the basic monosyllable speech starts from six to nine months. That's what we know. So we have to do early intervention. One more point in early intervention. If you go by the cortical genesis in auditory cortex, at the newborn, this is the, the thing in auditory cortex. These are the nerves. Go ahead, at one month, more and more nerves are coming, more and more sinuses are coming as the child getting older beyond six months. At 15 months, there is a nexus of nerves and at two years, look at the number of sinuses they are developed. So how do they develop? They develop on sensitization. If you don't sensitize, if you don't subject them to any noise, and if they don't have hearing capacity, these neurons will not develop. So there will not be any development of the brain, that part, particular part of the brain, that inferior gyri of your temporal lobe. Behind that ear, visual lobe is there. So the, this has also been proved on the Vera images that auditory nerve is subjected to degeneration if it is not used. Like you can understand by this. This is, you know, basic unit of clear. You can see the inner ear cells, outer ear cells. These are the interneuronal cells going from here and there. Outer ear cells, they modify the sound, they modulate the frequency of the sound, and this is how the sign, this goes, and these are the nerves which carry the uh, sensation to the brain. So this is how this works, and there is an area for hearing, and there is an area for visual activity, like that, your occipital cortex. What happens when you are hearing, when you are, there is some defect in cochlear like in congenital deafness, maybe the hair cells are released, are they reduced in number or necrosed, or somehow they are deficit, or there are outer hair cells or inner hair cells, mostly the outer hair cells dysfunction is there. So what would happen then? Due to this lack of hair cells, there would be lack of information to the auditory pathway, there would be 
less development of this auditory nerves there till the cortex. So what would happen? Your auditory cortex would be taken, captured by the visual cortex or any other surrounding area. So it is up to you. You use it or you lose it. So this is what happens there with the brain, any area in the brain. So there comes the concept of neural plasticity. So what is neural plasticity? It is the ability to learn any task given to brain. And you know the best, the maximum neural plasticity is there up to the age of three years. So there are some like something like hard wires in the brain. That is some pre-programmed structures are there that is there. Like movement of eyelid, like heartbeat, they are pre-programmed. But there are some, some areas for sense organ like hearing, they are known as plastic areas. And plastic, you know, you can mold plastic like anything. So if you don't use, if these plastic areas don't get any stimulation, like auditory deprivation is there, this plastic sets hard without anything. And that is of no use. But this is how the things go. Okay. So neural plasticity should be used as much as possible. So most of the intervention should be done within three years of age of the child. So what happens when child has got hearing loss in the infant itself? It, it affects the development of auditory nerve system. We have seen it will be captured by some other uh, neighboring area. It will interfere with the development of speech and language. And because of these things, there would be harmful effects on social, emotional, and cognitive functions as well. So what, how we go ahead with that? How can we prevent all these things, misfortunes happening to a kid? We have to set a goal of one, three, and six. Like we have to screen the kids within one month of age. We have to assess the uh, again whether the child is deaf or not within three months and earliest intervention should be done in the uh, by six months like maybe before discharge of a newborn kid you have to get either a bara or a either because bara is cumbersome to do and it has got some uh, false positive values there in a newborn you can use autoacoustic emission. So suppose autoacoustic emission says pass. That means this kid only requires one more testing at three months. If it also comes pass, then that means the hearing is normal. Suppose in the first go in the hospital itself, it says wrapper. That means OE is abnormal, shows the outer hair cell dysfunction. These kids should be reassessed within three months. If again it comes or turns out to be referred, that means abnormal outer hair cell dysfunction or no hearing there. By the age of six months only, we have to apply hearing aid, the digital hearing aid to these kids. Because you know, at the age of six years, uh, six months, the child starts with monosyllable words. So the speech starts from six to nine months. So this is something known as goal 136. And after hearing it started at six months, we have to implant these kids within one to three years of age. Got it? So, so how are babies tested? We have already talked about autoacoustic emission and bara. I think you know bara and autoacoustic emission. You can go in details of these investigations. Please do, please do read them. What is the basic, what are the different waves they come, what are the interpretations, what are the other diseases like multiple sclerosis, acoustic neuroma, you can come to know about it from this. So to, to get a success in habilitation, assess, early assessment should be done, early intervention should be done, and auditory habilitation should be done in form of speech and language therapy or auditory verbal therapy along with the hearing aid or cochlear implantation. Okay, because time is running out and we do not want any such schools for deaf where sign language is taught. 
I condemn sign language. We want a good hearing kit, maybe by the digital hearing aid or cochlear implant, and time is running out because uh, more older kids do not get much neural plasticity, so do not get a good habilitation in terms of hearing and hearing and language. So how to habilitate 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 in the, uh, these kids? At first, the parents should be counselled that they that they have got a pivotal role in child's uh, this speech and language therapy or habilitation because they are the best teachers to the kids. So their guidance is required. We can uh, give hearing aids, digitally hearing aids to the kid. Meanwhile, cochlear implant workup can be done. If child has got an abnormal cochlea or maybe there are contraindications to cochlear implant like there is no nerve or totally ossified cochlea, then we have to go for auditory brain stem implant. Then development of speech and language to be done by the auditory oral communications, manual communications. Then education of the deaf should be done in form of languages, different languages, different subjects and all, so that they get professional or vocational support. So there are a lot of hearing aids. Uh, no conventional hearing aids should be used now. There are better hearing aids in form of digital hearing aids. Basically, what is a hearing aid? It is an electronic device which is battery operated, you know, which the basic concept is to amplify the sound which is getting there in the ear. So they amplify the sound. Now with the digital hearing aid, what they do? They scan the sound and present to the inner ear as such. So they are giving a few qualities of sound alone. While the conventional hearing aids used to only amplify the sound, like the pocket type, the spectacle type hearing aids, the conventional hearing aids. So what used to happen? Any sound which is coming, like an, uh, an old man is sitting with that conventional hearing aid in the house, and there is a vehicle going outside on the road, and that sound is also being amplified to the ear. So he was like annoyed. Oh, I don't want to use this hearing aid. Every sound is coming so loud to me. So that was amplification only. Got it? Then we came with digital hearing aid. In digital hearing aid, you can programmatically, by the software, give inputs to amplify particular frequencies where the deficit is there. You don't have to amplify all frequencies. Then whatever sound is coming, the digital hearing aid it scans that sound and it presents the copy to the ear. So that is scanned original copy to the ear. Still, the problems are there. I, I will come to that later. So what are the indications of hearing aids? Sensitive hearing loss or maybe the deaf child as early as possible for development of speech and language we have already thought about. Conductive hearing loss in cases of congenital deafness, congenital uh, oral malformations where you can't operate. Patient has got congenital uh, conductive deafness, but you have to give hearing aid. Okay. So digital hearing aid makes a scanned copies. I've already told you. But if there is cochlear damage, suppose these congenitally deaf kids, you are giving them hearing aid. No doubt they should be started with hearing aid so that at least you save some time when you are going to do a cochlear implantation before that, that period is not going to be wasted. With the hearing aid, patient is getting some sensitization of listening for hearing. They are getting some noise so that their brain is getting stimulated. Their cochlear residual fibers, her hair cells, their auditory now, their auditory cortex is getting stimulated or sensitized somehow. So if there is cochlear damage, there is all function lost. And most important thing is frequency modulation. Most important is the, the changing the different parameters and qualities of voice, which is done by outer air cells. So all these things are lost. So hearing aid won't do much benefit in these conditions. So what we are left with then cochlear implantation. So the biggest challenge to replicate the cochlear function is selective amplification, a function of motile uh, uh, outer air cells. Basically, 
frequency modulation. <clears throat> so we then we came with up with bone anchored hearing or maybe bone or in middle ear hearing aid complex uh, concept. Why? If it is having some problem there, why can't we directly stimulate the cochlear nerve? Why can't we directly stimulate the uh, hair fibers, hair cells? So this, this is how the concept of your bone anchored hearing aids or middle ear implants came. They are directly stimulating the nerve as such. If you read about uh, Ludwig Beethoven, the, one of the best men ever there in the history of mankind, he has produced many symphonies. And you know, when he produced his last, he created, synthesized his last symphony, uh, he was totally dead. Then how could he do this marvelous piece of music? If you listen to it, you would love it. Beethoven's, you, you listen to that, and it is marvelous piece of music he has given. How could he, because he is not listening himself. So he at first, he was the first one to use a metal rod, putting in the, between the teeth and keeping on the piano. So when he was playing piano, these vibrations are going to the uh, teeth and to the, directly to the nerve. Uh, and he's getting the music. So this was the concept of bone conduction came and we came with bone conduction hearing aids, middle ear implants and, and then if they don't work, cochlear implants. Bone conduction hearing aids, if, if you talk about the hearing loss pattern, if it is a mild sensory hearing loss, then digital hearing aids are the best things to be used. If it is moderate to severe sensory hearing loss, basically, then you can use a bone anchored hearing aid or maybe middle ear implant like vibrant sound bridge. If it is severe to profound, what is preferable over anything, any other thing is cochlear implants. If it is a profound SN loss, you can use either the Baha unilateral. If it is unilateral, Baha can give rise, can give uh, uni, the ipsilateral as well as contralateral stimulation of the cochlea through bone conduction, and that could be used or a cochlear implant. If it is a mixed hearing loss or maybe a moderate type of hearing loss, you can either use a bone bridge or you can use a vibrant sound bridge like middle ear implants. And if it is a ski sloping deafness in which some residual hearing is there, you can use electroacoustic hybrid implant in which the lower frequency, which is preserved there in the ear, these air cells are preserved, they are avoided and only high frequency, lost high frequency nerve fibers are stimulated with a hybrid digital hearing aid or maybe a compressed or short hearing cochlear implant. There are some hearing loss which are temporary, like temporary threshold shift in noise induced hearing loss or maybe it's some trauma. They are repairable, but there are some permanent hearing loss which requires something else. So what are the options we do have? Hearing aid we have talked about, then cochlear implants. Cochlear, if you go by the cross section of cochlear uh, implant, how does, this is the organ of cortile. When uh, your sound is coming, uh, it is vibrating the timpanic membrane, malleus in case stapes is moving, stapes is moving like piston inside. So in the scale of vestibuli, you know, the fluid is moving, coming on to the helicotrema, then relaxed, going back to the, the scleral tympani. So why this movement of the fluid, the basilar membrane moves, by movement of this basilar membrane, the air cells, they strike with this tectorial membrane and there is depolarization there and, elect, uh, and there are channels open and that's how the electrical signals go in this uh, uh, nerve, your cochlear nerve up to the spiral ganglion and that makes the whole nerve. But what happens when there is spoils, when there are hair cells lost? There is cochlear damage, congenital deafness. So there would, wouldn't be any uh, association or contact between hair cells and tectoid membrane, so nerve is not being stimulated. So what does the cochlear implant do? If it is not there, the cochlear implant will directly stimulate the nerve. So this is how the things go on. 
So what is a cochlear implant? It's an auditory prosthesis. You know, it is eighth wonder. According to Bill Clinton, the previous president of US, this is eighth, one, eighth wonder on the earth, the cochlear implant, in which replaces a sense organ. No other sense organ can be replaceable like hearing, hearing sense. So auditory device that is interfaced into the cochlear nerve with external device, okay? So uh, basically, if you talk about human cochlea, it is also an electromagnetic, electromechanical constitution. So the basal turn, we know we have got a higher frequencies at the apical turn, lower frequencies, and the cochlear implant has made like this. So who were the brain involved in formation on in invention of these implants? At first, it was Alessandro Volta himself. He stimulated his own cochlear nerve, putting a wire inside with a 50 volt current. Then came William House with a single channel implant first in 1961. And then Green Clark was one who came with a multi-channel implant. And then discovery goes on and we are getting so many advanced implants these days. So before the discussing uh, the surgical techniques, we should know about something about candidacy. Who are the candidates uh, who should be implanted? What are the various implications of cochlear implantation? What are the various investigations? How to approach surgically? What are the various surgical methods or approaches? And what are the outcomes and how to measure the outcomes? Okay, so selection criteria is 12 months or a age of older. Some people are even doing at the age of nine years. But right now, CDC, Center for Disease Control, US, because we always follow CDC guidelines. So Center for Disease Control in America, it has given guideline of one year or more should be implanted. A bilateral profound sensory hearing loss, but these days it is changing to severe to profound. Then aided audiometric threshold that fall outside speech range should be at 2K Hertz. There should be insufficient help or audition through the conventional hearing aids or maybe digital hearing aids. And uh, no efficient skin or uh, speech or language development that makes an indication for cochlear implant. There should be no active middle ear disease. Radiologically, the patient should be good. And there should be realistic family expectations. Sometimes uh, the parents, they think like the implant is inside and the child will start speaking. This is not that. You have to counsel them, convince them, you have to make them understand that this is a gradual process. It requires help from you, from audio verbal therapist, from doctor, from so many people around us, even a child psychologist, sometimes neurologist, ophthalmologist, a lot of, a lot of people, they come as a team for a cochlear implant program. It is not like this. You just operate the second day listening. No, it, is, it does not happen. It is a tedious job. Okay. So if in adults, if you talk about selection criteria, 18 years or uh, uh, older, profound bilateral sensory hearing loss, post-lingual onset of profound deafness, getting no relief with the hearing aids, and there is no medical or radiological contraindication. Which should which kids should not be implanted with a cochlear implant? An absolute contraindication is absence of cochlea or the cochlear nerve. Okay. Then comes relative uh, things like a thin, a very atrophied thin cochlear nerve, or maybe cochlear malformations, maybe totally ossified cochlea or active middle ear infection. Okay. A uh, new criteria for uh, CI candidate now, it is changing. People are doing even less than one year of the age group. From profound to it is coming up to the even the severe. In severe to profound also, in bilateral severe also, we can do an implant. Prelingual adults can also be implanted before the age of 18 years. Children with complex needs can also be considered. And waiting period for digital hearing aid for six months should be reduced. Uh, what we used to do, we used to do that, go for a hearing aid, six months, see to it, see to the response, then cochlear implant. We, we are delaying, we are delaying uh, the implantation and we are like 
uh, getting a deficit of neural plasticity. So earliest implantation should be done with initial stimulation by the hearing aid. Mild form cochlea can also be done these days. We have done a, quite a number of cases. And cases with residual hearing can also be implanted these days. And that is a better thing because some residual hearing in low frequencies, they're already there. So we are using hybrid implants so that the residual hearing is being taken care by the of uh, the cost electroacoustic stimulation and implant is taking care of higher frequencies. Age of implant goes down, even single sided deafness are also being considered. Bilateral implantation is being preferred as compared to the uh, single uh, unilateral implantation at first or doing the sequential implantation later on. Cases of tinnitus with deafness are also being considered and even cases of auditory neuropathy which were which was a contraindication to implant in the initial era is now it comes up in the era of operating. What are the various factors of implantation like years of deafness? Uh, a minimal duration of deafness from onset to implantation better results. From onset delayed period has gone then you implant not a good not good result. Then length of sensory deprivation the same thing if no hearing aid has been given so sensory deprivation has been done to the patient and implantation results are not that good. Socioeconomic economic factors, educational factors, they come into play, general health of the patient, individual ability, psychosocial development, and onset of deafness, whether it is a congenital or adventitious. Because a perilingual deafness, if it is there, or a postlingual, it is there, we do have a good results as compared to the congenital deafness. Then willingness to participate in their program, language skills, realistic expectations of the parents we have already talked about, desire to communicate. If the kid is dumb, the kid is like has got a low IQ, doesn't want to speak like in Down syndrome or some other syndromes, then implantation results are not that good. And cochlear patency, if the cochlea is not patent properly or it is partially ossified sort of thing or congenital morph then good results are not there. So the best age to implant is uh, one to three years. Suitable, maybe you can do up to six years or seven years, but not a good results. Why variable outcomes are there after that age. Before implantation, immunization should be done. If it is less than two years, you know, we already would have given uh, H and flange bean uh, vaccine. We would have given meningococcal vaccine up few of them and we would have given a pneumococcal vaccine but if child has not been vaccinated at first we have to according to the latest latest cdc criteria in the last in two years you require hip at hn plan gb and only pneumococcal because meningococcal infections do not occur in kids less than two years of age and meningococcal usually occur after the age of 10 to 12 years so what we require is pneumococcal vaccine if the child is more than two years and has not gone through these vaccines, then at first <coughs> pneumococcal conjugate vaccine 13, at least two to three doses should be given at eight weeks apart to each other. And then after giving these doses eight, eight weeks, the uh, wait should be done. Then a pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine 23 should be given. So this is the latest criteria only PCV13 and PPSV23. So how to evaluate these kids? We have to evaluate the whole ENT, ear, nose and throat, the CT scan, MR should be done, a pure tone audiometry, then we do VARA, ASSR, autocaustic emissions, a speech testing in done in older kids, aided audiograms can also be done in older kids, then meet and talk to the other recipients, the, the kid as well as the parent should be uh, taken along the other cochlear implant, previously cochlear implanted kids and their parents, so that they get the realistic uh, things. They get motivated. They, they they get to know what they have to do later on. And then cross references by an ophthalmologist, pediatrician, psychiatrist, neurologist, cardiologist should be done all together. Okay. The imaging, what we prefer is to get both the things, HRCT as well as MRI brain and CP angle done. 
if there is a time delay between the implantation and the old imaging if images are older than more than 3 months then we should get a repeat mri done and see on imaging for rotation of cochlea distances uh, from the vital structures skull bone thickness abnormalities if there are any there you see the uh, vestibular aqueduct thickness you see for uh, the facial nerve relations. So all these things should be done. I think this requires a separate class about the radiology of temporal bone. I, I can't go into details of uh, all these things in this particular class. So surgery is done. It takes around one to three hours, one to two days hospital stay, stays there. And the switching on is done at, the, at around 14 to 21 days. The first fitting is called switch on and tuning up. The outcomes are variable according to all the factors we have already discussed. Uh, there are implants with special arrays like compressed array we have already talked about. They are used in labyrinthine ossificants uh, or maybe a single cavity, common cavity cochlea. And if there is some residual hearing, then we can use a compressed array for only the higher frequency loss. Or maybe they can be split in two or three uh, electrode channels or they could be double implants so that they go in different uh, turns of the cochlea if there is some ossification there in the labyrinth. Then there are concepts of modular hugging electrodes or lateral hugging electrodes. Obviously, a modulus hugging electrode would be would give better results because it will be close to the nerve endings. It would be close to the spiral ganglia and laterally you do have stravascularis. So, if it is close to that, you have to give uh, less what is sound. You don't have to amplify the sound. You, you have to decrease the, the intensity of sound so that the child does not get high intensity sound that disturbs its psychology. That can also stimulate the facial nerve. Sometimes facial twitching happens. So, it has to be modulus hugging, which goes along the modulus. And battery life is also extended because you don't have to give higher currents. So these are beneficial. <clears throat> then if you could do a bilateral, bilateral implantation should be done. Because with the unilateral implant, what happens? There wouldn't be any localization of sound. I've got an implant there. If sound is coming from there, I can't get out because get it because of the head shadow effect. Got it? So a bilateral implant should be done so that we get a good temporal recognition of the sound in this or the spatial recognition or orientation. Okay, and patient can uh, appreciate the internal time delay. It improves the understanding of noise uh, speech in the noisy environment also. So which ear should be operated first? A better hearing ear, a ear which has been recently deaf, made deaf, uh, uh, has become deaf. A least obstructed labyrinth in case of labyrinth ossificants. Uh, if it is a recent trauma, a ear with better vestibular function should be preserved and the contralator ear should be done. If it is a canal down mastectomy done, then the fresh <coughs> contralator ear should be operated. Surgical approaches, if you do the conventional uh, transmastoid. And posterior demonotomy approach is there. Then other approaches like middle force approach or supramutal approach, that is a varia technique, uh, which has been given by Professor Trifon Karatidis from Greece, from Varia village. And then a modified varia technique is there, which we have given. Surgical steps, if you go, they are common to all these things. Should be done under general anesthesia, of course. The patient is supine with the head tilted towards opposite side, like you do the timbanoplasty or mastodectomy surgery. Then you do have various skin incisions. What I prefer to do, what we prefer to do is post uh, skin incision with a bit of lazy ass upwards. After elevating the skin flap, musculoperiosteal flap is elevated. We prefer a superiorly based musculoperiosteal flap. Then a mastodectomy. Or done or in the varia supramutal well is uh, made. I will show it later on. Posterior hypnotomy or the well is or the tunnel is made. 
we have to expose a round window you can drill a bit of the round window niche and round window once it is exposed don't open the membrane of the round window right now at first do the well job you make a well for the receiver uh, with the channel conduits then once you are done with the things you uh, take out the impl implant put in there in the receiver well and then before insertion you incise the round window membrane and put in the implant so that you prevent any in entry of saline or blood or bone dust in the cochlear duct okay so these are various incisions what we prefer is we just use a small post incision which is curved a bit like this and this incision should not fall on the receiver stimulator there if this incision is far back it will come over the receiver stimulator and there would be they would uh, it wouldn't work properly because the the processor is over it so it wouldn't work properly and it can get necrosed and implant can be extruded okay and comes when previous if previous surgery has been done use the same detoral incision try uh, avoid making a well or a channel over the uh, these suture lines of the skull stay away from the suture lines then lazy as incisions the incision just as i have already told you it gives proper coverage of the implant and also access for drilling of the receiver well the demerit is sometimes if it is very small kid on uh, then there might be superficial fission loss which can get injured but it doesn't happen because that is least possible because we are operating more than one years of age group minimal access incisions are there small postural then after arranging the skin flap you raise this superiorly based musculoperiosteal flap okay so this is right here this is superior inferior anterior posterior so this is superiorly based musculoperiosteal flap has been elevated you can see the suture lines there and in this case the anteriorly based palvas flap what we call the musculoperiosteal <coughs> sorry flap has been elevated okay we prefer a superiorly based flap because it doesn't fall short later on when you close it and it covers everything and the implant is not exposed while if you take anteriorly based the implant is exposed there with the suture line a mastectomy is done after doing a mastectomy see for the incus short process of incus this is left ear i'm talking about now mastectomy and posterior mastectomy approach so once you have done a cortical mastectomy don't do it like cortical mastectomy don't uh, be well or make these uh, uh, these margins of the well flat rather uh, keep them undermined so that like, the channel can be kept inside so once you see the editors you see this short process of incurs this is a bone less known as incudal bridge just inferior to there you have to build there because this is your lateral semicircular canal and this is your facial coming over here so we are going with the facial recess approach okay so this is how facial recess has been opened you can see the the pyramid the stapedius the in the stapes and you can see the round window there so once you have exposed this you are seeing this exposure of the round window how do you further expose around window so that you can easily put in the uh, implant there electrode channel there you drill a bit of niche of this round window got it so this is right here we are seeing through the posterior monotomy and this bone you drill a bit and this bone also has to be taken by the hook this is known as hook reason so you can use a needle or a pick to remove this bone so that electrodes do not touch it or get some friction out of it and get injured okay so then how to insert once you have removed this uh, bony niche around the round window you see the round window once the implant has been well sutured apply a place you use uh, this wood uh, makers forceps or javeliers forceps to hold the implant and put it through the incised round window membrane in modified varia what 
I with Dr. Amit Goel from AIM Jodhpur, Dr. Amit Kesri from SGPJ Lucknow, and Dr. Rajiv Kapila from Ludhiana. We have modified the uh, classical variant technique to modified variant technique. What is that? In this modified variant technique, we are taking that this is right here, this is inferior, superior, anterior, inferior, uh, posterior. Okay. This lazy has incision, then superiorly based musculoperiosteal flap. I'm raising. This has been raised and uh, sutured uh, upside, legs upside. I'm raising the tympanometrial flap. I'm flattening a bit bone laterally so that my varia tunnel goes well. I am making a small well in the mastoid area. It should not be deep enough to go to the mastoid antrum. You don't require to disturb the normal anatomy there. Then this is a uh, varia handpiece we are using and making a tunnel. Then after receiver well is made, you are making the conduit for the channel and you always leave some cantilever there. After you have done this, uh, you you are uh, drilling a bit of the round window niche to see the round window membrane there. You are incising round window membrane. Then after incising, you are removing the hook, hook area a bit. Okay. Then you are placing implant through the tunnel. Once it turn, comes out in the middle ear, you just guide it towards the round window or maybe the extended round window or maybe cochleosomy if you make a separate cochleosomy. And this is how the uh, electrode is uh, progressed inside. You can hold it firmly, softly. Do not injure it. And then the rest of the channel is placed in the well. And soft tissue sealing is done all around the round window. Uh, you can put in a graph there so that if some injury has happened to that, this can be done. Okay. So this is something what I have told you is soft tissue technique, soft surgical technique. You ex do an extended round window, a delayed cochleosomy with immediate closure with the soft tissue, no suction, no much drilling, avoid uh, entry of blood or bone dust there. You can use a steroid inside so that it lubricates. It prevents the ossification inside the cochlea. Or no stiffening ring inside and use a micro hook. Then after doing implant in the operating setup itself, we do either the NRT neural response telemetry with the cochlear company or maybe NRI with the uh, uh, with the this thing uh, advanced bionic or you can do uh, 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 intraoperative radiologic imaging in case of medial electrodes and post-op access should be taken maybe intraoperative if you do have facility inside the OT you can get an x-ray which shows your implant in place this should be well seen and there are certain post-operative complications like bleeding sometimes patient of injury is there sometimes you have injured the cord embryo to give rise to taste sensations sometimes you have injured some vestibular apparatus to give rise to vertigo and all so all these things are there when the dyson infection as I've already told you how to avoid these uh, things, flap necrosis, sometimes CSF leak is there, electrode misdisplacement, or maybe device failure, extrusion. So all these things has to be taken according, according to each complication. We have to do that. So the, the detail of these complications beyond the, the scope of this lecture, I think that will require a separate class. So what happens after surgery? We have to do a post-op rehabilitation, the switching on from 14 to 21 days. Then mapping is done with the help of auditory verbal therapist. Then we get some scores like CAPS score or SIR scores, speech intelligibility uh, scores. All these things are done over time and the, the mapping and tuning, it goes on along, along auditory verbal therapy and uh, rehabilitation is done. So results, uh, uh, what are the various factors which affect the results we have already talked about? No cochlear implant can restore the normal hearing. This is something we should keep in our mind, but we should try to do our best. Outcome, variable outcomes, we have seen. Primary goal is to improve the speech because why hearing is important to a human? To communicate with each other. That is the most important thing. So this good speech should be developed 
and then post lingual uh, patient also they achieve good open set and good discrimination should be there and then the pulse of wisdom like minimal invasive surgery should be suitable route of insertion should be acquired according to your your teaching your experience your expertise and then according to the best techniques available you can choose one and master of it then genital soft tissue techniques i have told you control of inflammatory response to electrode can be done with insulation of some steroid in the cochlear duct and a traumatic electrode should be done so why are cochlear implant numbers increasing in the world because early identification is being done that is the most important point i have been telling since initiation then attitude of the patient and attendants is changing now they are coming up with the kids at the earlier age technology advancements are there candidacy requirements are also changed and surgical risk is decreasing with the with the more and more training and rehabilitation what are the other means of rehabilitation if cochlear implant does not work brain stem there are some there are some stem cell therapies available not successful yet but maybe in future we can come up with that you have to read it separately then prp plat plateal risk plasma therapies are there for some hearing losses they inject the prp inside the cochlea and see for response some studies done but not much helpful but it is under investigation so your thought process is what do you see on this picture i'm asking you students if you see this picture how do you remove a ping pong ball from a tube bolted on the floor this is a tube which has been bolted on the floor okay you can't move this tube you can't just move it upside down the ball will come out such an easy process but this is bolted how do you take it out so many instruments have been given to you you know always apply your brain just fill it up with the water the ball will come up and you just take out so you have to apply your brain the easiest possible approach should be uh, taken without damaging anything and one more important thing is what this video will show you you see you can recognize he is ronaldo you see his face his eyes he is not seeing right he is not seeing left he is not seeing ahead or back not up not down he is just seeing the ball that means the focus his focus is on the ball only to get a goal got it so please dear students focus yourself to the studies focus what you want to do in your life because you are there with expectations from your parents you are there with expectations from your near abouts your friends this society the whole country the mankind so please focus set your goals and achieve them thank you so much so i'll stop share i'll do a stop sharing dr nilima yes yes dr pavan yeah yes you can stop sharing yeah i've done that um, but we've lost your uh, my image video yeah yeah oh, start video it is there okay yeah yeah so that was an excellent uh, talk and uh, learned a couple of things uh, new things and um, the last video was really <laughs> very uh, i think uh, motivating for the uh, participants so there uh, are questions we, there? we have some uh, one question in the uh, chat box initially i think the voice was breaking a bit but uh, then it became all right maybe some net problem okay and so there's one question, question from vijay rawat uh, if an infant has retrocochlear deafness he will pass the screening with oe how to assess or suspect to instruct parents yes very good question uh, vijay I, i really appreciate you have asked this question that's why vijay we have got bara and oe both there in our armamentarium so once the the kid passes oe okay it is passed on and in this hospital itself we are again calling that kid for two things not only oe only for bara also 
because Bera will will give you uh, all these details, and we can avoid um, we can we can't miss these kids. Okay, so and we can uh, intervene earliest. Any other question? Yeah, so OE is used as a screening uh, tool, yes. and then we have to supplement it with uh, a beta, yeah. and may have to repeat it also. Yes, so, so we repeat yeah. OE at three months also. Yes, even if uh, the kid has passed in mm. uh, first go at the hospital instead, or maybe within one month, we have to repeat it at three months. This is done. Any other question there? I. I don't see any question. Any other no, question? I, I don't think we have. Uh... Uh, okay, Shubankar Tiwari comes up with a question. In elderly patient with perforation, how to weigh whether surgery is going to benefit or hearing aid? Shubankar, another good question. I, I, I'll, I'll appreciate this. Why? Because in elderly, suppose if it is a conductive hearing loss, Obviously, you have to operate so that you are giving hearing to the patient. Okay, this is one thing. But if the patient has got sensitive hearing loss, then comes two points. If it is totally dry, does not ever get wet. It has got tympanous sclerosis. You can make out that through the margins of the perforation or something like that. Then you have to just augment his hearing with a hearing aid, a good digital hearing aid. But if the patient complains that Quite often, or sometimes it gets wet. It's get infected again and again. Then you can't advise hearing aid to this patient because the hearing aid cannot work in a wet ear and it, it gets dysfunctional. So at first you have to operate them. With the guarded prognosis, you are telling them that this surgery will not improve your hearing. I'm just doing this surgery so that your hearing aid fitting can be done. So this should be there in their mind. Okay. So this is how the thing proved. Any other question, students? We still we have some around maybe or two or three more minutes. Yeah. Thank you, Shubankar, for asking such a good question. Uh, so I, I'm I'm really elated to see these questions. You guys are reading, and you guys are interested because you guys has got so much of uh, responsibilities on your on your shoulders to see the mankind. We oldies won't last ever. You guys are <laughs> gonna take care of ENT of the population there in India. Dr. Pavan, you are not old. <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> but still, uh, these students they do have responsibilities yeah, and yes. focus there. Yes. Yes. Oh, so um, I don't no think we questions. have a yeah yeah. So we don't have any more um, uh, questions, and uh, Mr. Navneet will close it here. Then it's almost seven. Yeah, sure, Dr. Nilima. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pawan Singhal, for the presentation, and thank you very much, Dr. Nilima Gupta, for moderating this session, and thank you to Inis for joining us. Thank, thank you for inviting me. It was uh, such a good uh, platform to share the ideas and uh, no doubt I always love teaching students. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Dr. Pawan, and thank we you. will um, uh, keep you engaged with us uh, in future. Any well. topic, anytime, <laughs> right, we yeah. can do that. Thank, thank you. Thank you.